Open uh, your Bibles with me, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter 8. We're there. I'll tell you what, I've taught this book before a couple times, and it's like I just have this anticipation of getting to chapter 8, climbing the mountain. We're going to talk about that. You probably wondered why. Oh, yeah, on our, on our slide here, we have base camp because we're going we're gonna to do some work here in this section of this book. In Romans, so far, we have looked at a lot of stuff. This is a major break in the book. Uh, the first seven chapters, uh, doctrinal, highly doctrinal, but practical as well. We looked in chapters uh, 118 through 320 uh, at the depravity of man at the sinfulness, the utter sinfulness of man. Nobody gets off because he talks about there. Yeah, he talks about the heathen. He talks about the people that are doing crazy stuff out there. But then he goes all the way, he swings all the way from that to the moralist, to the, the moral person, the good, upstanding moral person. And, and his need for Christ being equal to the one who's out there doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So he goes from there into chapter 5, where we looked at uh, the fact that our identity as human beings is in Adam prior to Christ. We'll talk about that a little bit this morning, where uh, that we are in Adam, that the natural man. He talks about the fact that in Christ, we are taken from that place of being in Adam to being now in Christ. That's where our identity is. That's what that means, is identified. My life is identified with Christ, not the world, not this worldly system, not the junk that man foists out there. We, we looked at length at that. I'm not going to belabor it, but sort of working our way to here. In chapter 6, we uh, looked at uh, the fact that not only are we justified, because in chapter 5, we talked about being justified, justified by faith in chapter 4 as well. That, and, and what that means is that it's way beyond, and I understand when I hear preachers say that means it's like, look at it, it's just as though I never sinned. That's true, but it goes way beyond that. I mean, when you read in God's word that we as Christians, we as believers are seated in the heavenlies with Christ, that's a little more than just as though I never sinned. And so, I mean, it's a lot more, infinitely more. And so we've looked at that. We've looked at what it means to be justified, to, to be declared righteous not my own, but his, to be clothed in the righteousness of God. We looked at that uh, there in in chapters 4 and 5, and then in chapter 6, we began to look at this thing called sanctification. It's like, what is that? It's a major doctrine in the Christian faith, but what does it mean? And what it means is that not only have I been declared righteous and That's a done deal. I'm not getting more righteous because that's the fruit of God's spirit. We'll look at that as we go. But now I've been declared holy, positionally speaking. Practically speaking, I am being made holy. That does increase in my life. And so we've looked at that. As we come to this, to Romans chapter 8, what a majestic passage this is. This is the, the great chapter that sets forth that, that part of our salvation, which is exercised by the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, folks, dig in on this. Spend time reading through this chapter in one sitting on your own. Uh, go through it and then go through it again. And I guarantee you, God will begin to speak to you in remarkable ways. Not just about the nature of the transaction or the transactions, but about the nature of his love for us. Interesting, without the work of Christ on the cross, there would be obviously no salvation. Without the work and the presence and the constant operation of the Holy Spirit, there would be no application of that salvation to us. He is the one that reveals it. He is the one that brings that home to us. 
So whereas our salvation comes by faith in the work of the cross, revelation of that salvation comes through the work of the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, bar none, is the greatest exposition of life in the Spirit in all of God's Word. So I'm going to draw an allegory or or a metaphor here, and and we're going to use it. Uh, I I think it's a cool one. I mentioned last week uh, that looking at Romans as though Romans 8 is being the the tallest peak. In 1802, the British, they were still empire building at that point. They they launched what became known as the Great Survey. Uh, They wanted to map the the sub- uh, continent of India, that whole area of Eastern Asia. And they're doing a lot of colonizing there. Interesting, uh, they had bulky equipment and rugged terrain, monsoons, malaria, scorpions, deadly ones. And they made the work extremely difficult. Even so, the surveyors were able to take astonishingly Uh, accurate measurements as they went through the land. They soon proved that the Himalayas uh, there in Nepal in that area uh, and not the Andes of South America were, uh, that was what everyone previously believed, were the highest mountain range in the world. By 1852, uh, the British had identified Everest. Uh, Then it was called Peak XV, Tried to find something on that, I couldn't. But it was the tallest of them all. Uh, And by 1856, this is an interesting fact, they'd calculated its height to be 29,002 feet above sea level. Modern GPS technology found that they were only off by 27 feet. Needless to say, the the slang term, which I know you're going to connect with this, you're a hiker. (laughs) The slang term, or the the common term, is Everest would become known as the roof of the world. Uh, Interesting. The book of Romans, as I previously mentioned, it could be likened to the Himalayas, the tallest range in all of the New Testament writings. Nestled in the middle of the book of Romans is chapter 8, the Everest of the Bible, truly. The Everest of New Testament theological understanding. The Everest of the Spirit-filled Christian life and Christian living. Ironically, the literal Mount Everest is extremely dangerous. More than 300 people over the years have died on the mountain. They leave their corpses up there. It's too difficult to get them off. But here in and that's where my metaphor falls apart. The opposite is true. Here, we discover that death lies below. That, that as we explore just what our Lord and Master said when he proclaimed in John chapter 5, verse 24, he said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Life, not death. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Only through reliance upon the Spirit of God as proclaimed here can we climb this mountain. Can we understand what's being said and discern the deep truths of Romans 8. Now, there's so much here. (laughs) We're not going to be summiting this mountain in one jump. It's not going to happen. Uh, you'll see, I'm going to give you an outline, and I know this is going to be kind of a, a, a classroom type of a setting for part of the message this morning, but it's necessary because you'll see by the time we work our way through the outline that there is way more here than we can cover in even a couple of sessions. It's, we're going to dig deep. So I see this today, what we're doing today is sort of establishing a base camp. That's why I titled this message Base Camp because we're going to venture out in, in the series of studies. We'll work our way upwards uh, as we explore the majesty. <laughs> and it is the majesty of this inspired writing uh, of just what it means to be in Christ. Also what it means to have Christ in me. 
So while it's true that Romans is deeply theological, and it, it is deeply theological, I mean, there are books and books and books written about the book of Romans, also books and books and books about Romans chapter 8. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to tag the theology. We're not going to ignore it. But our primary focus will be on the practical application of the truths presented with regard to a new and wonderful life that we have as part of our inheritance in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, there's a lot of hype out there, guys. Is there, are there supernatural workings of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I witnessed one on Tuesday. I just showed you the video where the Spirit of God fell on Heidi and uh, they didn't put the part in, and that's fine, about what she spoke because she spoke before they baptized her. And I just thought, Lord, you, what a beautiful picture of brokenness before you. What a beautiful picture. And I'm not trying to put her on a pedestal. We go through times where the Spirit of God touches our hearts. Watch him touch her deeply. So we want to understand what this is saying theologically, but we especially want to understand how it applies to our lives. So we're going to ask God to shape our thinking as we apply these things to living well in a broken world. I have told people repeatedly over my years as a pastor, I, I can't impact your circumstances. I don't know how. I don't have your circumstances. But let me tell you this. I can show you how from God's word to live well within them. That's Romans chapter 8. That's life in the Spirit. Because no longer are you identified with Adam, identified with this world. You're identified with Christ. And being identified with Christ, His Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you. And, and my will syncing up with His, I can actually live a life that's not impacted, that's not tossed around. Yeah, of course, things hit us and I look at the difference between the time I react and the time I respond. It gets shorter as I walk with the Lord. We're still, we, we have areas where we're broken and we need to, to rely on the Lord. I don't want to be unrealistic about this, but I also want to be very pragmatic. This is about life in the Spirit, and that is a birthright for every single Christian. So, as I mentioned, uh, looking back at chapter the, 6, 7, and 8, they, they address really the same theme, and that's the sanctification of the believer. Uh, in, in chapter 6, as I mentioned too, we, we, we looked at, at what it is uh, that as Christians, how we're called to live an entirely different life. If you remember in past studies, we've talked about that, that, that we are called to be different. We're set apart. That's what sanctified means. It means that you're set apart for God, unto God. So we've looked at that, that the positional and the practical sanctification, uh, having been declared holy, now being made holy. Uh, he also says that we were enslaved to sin. You'll serve whatever you're enslaved to. He says, rather now in Christ that we're enslaved to righteousness. Chapter 7, we looked at the how with regard to that life. And, and really, it, it's, it's sort of, I love the way that Paul goes about it. I looked at the, the Apostle Paul's own life as he typified each one of our lives and what happens when we try, we talked about trying last week, uh, to sanctify ourselves. It doesn't work. Uh, determined as we might be due to indwelling sin, we're destined to fail. It's not about trying to be a better Christian. It's not about that at all. As a matter of fact, that will snare you. I love Psalm 46.10. This is free. It's not in my notes. Where he says, be still. Know that I'm God. In Hebrew, that word be still literally means relax and let go. Anyway, in chapter 7, as we got through towards the, the second half of the chapter, we saw that Paul rode the elevator all the way to the basement. Man, I tell you what, he goes into a tailspin. Because he, he, and he's being very realistic. Remember, I talked about there are th four different types of people. I'm not going to go back into it. But truly, the one that I believe is represented by Paul's writings in Romans 7 is that 
He is a maturing Christian. He's a mature Christian. He is a believer. And not only is he a believer, he's walking with the Lord and he is outlining the struggle of what happens when he would try to do the things that he, he says, I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the things I want to do. He just gets all the way down into this whole deal. He spirals down all the way to verse 25 where he says, I praise God. I thank God. Because as he descends, he, he, he ends up in frustration, bewilderment. I mean, he's utterly condemned in the things that we read there. Uh, because the problem, it, it's not the law of Moses. The law of Moses sets a wonderful standard on how to live. But it doesn't and can never deliver the power to do it. That's where Romans 8 comes in. That's where we begin to see now that there is hope. There is a way out of the despair. There is a way out of the self-condemnation and the condemnation before God. We're going to look at both of those. There is a way out of just living my life on the margins to be fully in Christ. Chapter 8, we're going to see, begin to see that just what that life is, the life in the Spirit, that there's now power to live. There's, there's power to obey God. So as we work our way up this magnificent mountain of Romans 8, we need some spiritual climbing tools as we venture up. As I mentioned, our purpose is not just to acquire head knowledge, but to become wise in the things of God as we use the same tools that Solomon did in the Proverbs. I love reading the Proverbs because you, there's a clear pattern there. In, in, in Proverbs 9, verse 10, we read, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So he talks about wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in this verse. And it, it's easy to take sort of a cursory look at that and think that they're the same thing. They're not. <laughs> you can have knowledge without wisdom. Uh, I knew a guy when, when I lived in the Bay Area in California. This guy, he worked at a major think tank. He had, his father had clerked for the U.S. Supreme Court. This guy was highly educated. And, and, and yet, he, he, he was brilliant in, in a very, and I'm not trying to be critical. It's just an observation I made. He was brilliant in a very thin lane. And the rest of his life, he just, he could not figure out how to tie his shoes. I mean, he was really struggling all the time. He called me one time, says, oh, John, I just need that. <laughs> and I was like, you know, Andrew, I get it. He had knowledge. There wasn't a lot of wisdom. Again, not trying to be critical, just an observation. You can't have wisdom, though, without knowledge and understanding. That's why we do what we do here, folks. That's why we go verse by verse, line by line, chapter by chapter, book by book, through the Word of God. Not so that we can just be book smart. We want to know Jesus, the power of His resurrection. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. And through that knowledge, we want to possess greater understanding. Now understand it, apply this to Romans 8. So we're talking about knowledge, obtaining knowledge, and then through that knowledge, beginning to now understand, to make the linkage, to put things together, to, oh, I get it, those aha moments. And in that understanding, to gain wisdom as we practically apply God's word to our lives. That's why we do what we do. So some spiritual tools. Don't let this stop with just going, I get it. Don't let it stop with, I, I, I understand it, or I've memorized it, but let it go all the way to producing in you a godly wisdom through which you take the things that we're going to look at in, in this chapter, in, in this book, and, and every Sunday, really, but specifically here. They'll help you climb the mountain. They'll help you to make sense out of what's being said, They'll also help you to be able to apply these things to your life so that you can have a life that's really settled. And I'll tell you, I've gotten to the point, I have a number, I, true confessions, 
I have a number of news sites, mostly conservative, but a couple that are not, just because I want to know what the other side's doing. <laughs> but I have a number of news sites that automatically open when I open my computer browser. And I've noticed lately that if I start going there, and I don't want to be ignorant, it's not like I'm burying my head in the sands, but if I start reading every, and I start going, and I'm getting ready to study and to, to prepare like a message or to spend some time with the Lord myself, I start getting angry. I start feeling bewildered. I start feeling like, man, this stuff is just impacting me and I don't like it. Yeah, it's good. I mean, we're to discern the times and all of that, but our lives need to be centered here. Our lives can get adversely affected by being centered there and then looking at this. No, we're centered here and we look at that. That's looking through the right end of the telescope. Try to look through the wrong end of the telescope. <laughs> it's going to be myopic and weird. So we're going to take some time to outline this chapter as we go in. I'm going to go through an outline now. I don't know how long it'll take. Um, we may end up getting into the four, first four verses <laughs> of this chapter. We may not. Uh, I told Brian before service, I said, you know, with the slides, you're going to see that there's, there's stuff there, but I don't know. I, I, it's just whatever the Lord wants to do. So I want to take this and I want to look at six hikes in Romans chapter 8. Again, just playing with the metaphor. I, I, I like that kind of stuff. I'm a visual guy and all. Uh, and, and so as we look at this, we want to look at as we venture upward from here, as we venture into the text understanding the text in light of the context. And if you know me, you know that when I study God's word, I look at four contexts. I look at the textual context. What is it saying? What is it plainly saying? I look at the contextual context. In other words, Romans 8, in light of Romans 7, where Romans 7 is a disaster and Romans 8 is victory. So I look at the contextual context and then I look at the cultural context and look at the historical context. And we're going to weigh these things through as we go uh, and, and make sense of it together. So verses 1 through 4 uh, in this first one, uh, I've labeled that no longer condemned. That, and the subheads, I've got the, a title and then some subheads. That what, what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? I talked about it briefly a minute ago. But, but what does it mean? Why is that important? Why are we in Christ Jesus? And we know that Romans 8 is about Christ in me. Well, we're going to look at that. The second thing in, in verses 2 and 3, we're going to look at the law of the spirit of life. That is fascinating. He says that the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life, Romans 8, has set you free from Romans 7, the law of sin and death, where he is, again, he's drawing contrast to what he has just said. And when you understand what is being said there in, that, in, in verse 3, I'll tell you what, applying that truth to your life, life changing. Life changing. Because that's where we get delivered from religion. That's where we get delivered from checking the boxes. Oh, to be a good Christian, I got to check the boxes. And I am not in any way advocating sin. Jesus died for that. And he talks about that. But what I am saying is I'm advocating freedom in Christ. The law of the spirit of life has set us free. The last thing in, in this first section is that the law is fulfilled in us. I... I don't have to worry about it. I don't, and I am not saying that the, the, the Ten Commandments on the courtroom wall, wall are a bad thing at all. They're good. Personally, practically, I don't have to live according to the law. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at the law of Moses has 613 laws. <laughs> Take my word for it or count them yourself. I don't care. But truly, that's the law. That's the checkboxes. That's the lists. 
And, and not only that, but in, in Jesus' day and then in the Apostle Paul's day, the Jews had so expanded on that, they had written volumes, no less than 70 volumes of lists of obedience based on those 613. It wasn't enough because they thought, well, we're going to be really, really, really spiritual and we can keep some more. But we've already looked at, it doesn't work. It doesn't change, doesn't impact the heart. Only when our hearts have been impacted by the work of God, by the finished work of Jesus on the cross and the result of that, the resurrected life, which is life in the Spirit. Do we have any hope of living a life that's out in the open, walking in the light as he is in the light, as John says in 1 John? The law is fulfilled in us. We don't have to worry about it. Jesus fulfilled the law. And now by identity with him, the law is fulfilled in us, in him. Wonderful stuff there. I'm going to try not to preach each one of these as I go because it's just exciting. These are just great. And as you look through here, like I said, you'll see why we need to spend. It's not, this isn't optional. We need to spend time here. Because it, it, what Paul does is he just, uh, again, under the anointing, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, inspired to write the things that he's writing, he is putting things down rapid fire. And, and it's like each one is just so meaty and so weighty and so worth our consideration. The second hike, the second section that we're going to look at is the contrast between the old nature, the nature of Adam, and the new nature, the nature of Christ, the nature of spirit. We're going to look at what it is to have a spiritual mindset. He, again, he draws a contrast there. He says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And that's ours. It's, it's, it's freely available to us through the work of the spirit. We're also going to look at God is not neutral about my old nature, about the flesh. It's an enemy of God. James tells us that friendship with the world is hostility towards Christ. There's some hard-hitting things here. Uh, not stuff you're going to see on a Sunday school flannel graph, you know. <laughs> These are some really big truths. And then also in that section, we're going to look at the work of the indwelling spirit. We're going to look at when Jesus, you know, after he resurrected, he, he said, well, before he resurrected, he said, the Holy Spirit is with you, but he will be in you. And then after that, at the day of Pentecost, he came upon them. There are three manifestations of the Holy Spirit. The with you, we're going to look at that, the indwelling spirit comes after redemption, after salvation, after someone has given their life to Christ. But prior to that, he's knocking on the door of your heart. I, you know, I have shared Christ with a couple of guys that, I mean, that they just got up in my face. And I kind of pouted and thought I was being persecuted, but that's not persecution. I mean, as a younger Christian, and I remember this one guy, he was like, what do you mean? And I mean, he just unloaded on me. <laughs> he came to Christ and gave his life to the Lord and is a profoundly different person as a result of the new life, life in the Spirit. You, folks, you don't always know what's going on inside. And often when somebody just puts up a wall of anger, and they're pushing back is because God's speaking to them and they're not liking, they're uncomfortable. Jesus said that men love darkness more than they love light. In our natural state, that's true. Sin is attractive, isn't it? We've talked about that. We'll talk about how the Spirit then, once He has been with us and knocking on the door of our life, our hearts and all of that, when we respond to Him, that at that moment we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. If you are a Christian here this morning, you've trusted Christ for your sins, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The third manifestation, uh, something akin to what we were observing with Heidi, is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you can have more than one. And no, that doesn't mean that you speak in tongues. 
as a matter of fact, that, that's, a, that's such a weird doctrine. The Bible specifically says not all will. But what it means is that you're empowered to serve God. If you are trying to serve God in any other way, it's a work of the flesh. And it, it's kind of like a freight train. It, you can keep that thing going for a while. I mean, my stepdad drove trains for a living. And, and, and when he got three miles out of Los Angeles, he, he cut the power all together and let that thing just coast in because it'll coast for a long time. Point is, it will come to a stop. Life in the Spirit's not like that. When he empowers us for service, it's a thing that he does. And that baptism of the Holy Spirit is to energize us, to empower our lives to be useful and fruitful in whatever ministry it is that he gives us. Because we all are ministers. Every single one of us are ministers. We are servants of God. The work of the church, the, if you look in Ephesians, in chapter 4, he says, he says the work of the church, the work of the, what we do here is not for me to stand up here and be spiritual for you. I call that school bus church. You know, you all put your money in the box and you pay me to be spiritual and you're just kind of riding along and I'm driving this thing. That's not, that's not the church. That's not the New Testament model for the church. Nor do I want that yoke. <laughs> I, I'm busy. The model is, is that he has work for all of us to do. The work of the church is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I love that God put it on somebody in our church's heart to rebuild our fireplace. It's like, and I told him, I said, you know what? I love that because I see your heart in it. It's not just, well, I want to throw some things up there. No, it's just, it was, I've been praying about this and I've got this idea and I've got that. And it's like, yes, I love it. Equipping the saints for the work of ministry. There's work for us to do. Yeah, we want to be able to have people come in here, sit at the feet of Jesus and learn and get to know us, us get to know you, and in due time, there's work to do. And that may not be in the four walls of the church. It may be out there doing something else. I know someone else in our body that has the gift of giving, and God just blesses them with all this stuff. And then they go around and they distribute it as the Lord leads to other people with, that need stuff. <laughs> and it's a remarkable thing. I call it, as the pastor, I call it having a seat up close to see what God's doing in other people's lives. And I love that. I love that. It's a result of the indwelling work of the Spirit. It's also a result of the baptism of the Spirit. We'll look at all three and we'll take, a, take a, a, an in-depth look at each one of those as we go along. The third, hike up the mountain, sons and daughters. In Israel, in the Old Testament, God remained far off. It, it could only happen one day a year. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, where the high priest would take and he would go in this tabernacle or in the temple later and, and it was like the closer he got to that tent, the more dangerous it became because of sin. And so he would start out at this big altar and, and he would you know, sacrifice the animal. He'd lay his hands on the animal and they'd cut its throat and watch it bleed out. It was a very messy thing, but you know what? Sin is messy. And then he would take and he would go from there and then he would go to this, this big basin, the laver is what they called it, where he would ceremonially cleanse himself. Probably more than ceremonially. I imagine he's covered with blood at that point. And then he would go from there into the tent, into the holy place, 15 by 15 by 30 feet. But once inside, the symbolism becomes powerful to what is fulfilled in Christ in us. There on his right would be the table of showbread, 12 loaves, each one representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel because they couldn't come in. They were dirty because of sin. So that one guy, he had to first atone for his own sins and then once he did that, he could go in and begin to atone for the sins of the people. But the people were represented there. On the other side, uh, the, the, the brass or the golden candle stand with seven... Um, lamps on it. 
representing the Spirit of God. Spirit hadn't been given yet, couldn't be, because we're still in our sin. And in front, the altar of incense, the, the beautiful altar where they put incense on it, represented the prayers of the people rising up to God. All of it highly symbolic, but all of it illustrating the fact that God is removed from man in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. The atonement, the Messiah hadn't come yet. Man had not been cleansed. And so there had to be a separation. And only one man once a year. Now they did that, the priestly service all the time, every day in the holy place. But one man once a year could go behind the veil in the second compartment, 15 by 15 by 15 feet. And, and that was the high priest once a year so that he could atone for the sins committed in ignorance for the rest of the nation. All of it, again, signifying, yeah, is there access to God? One guy, once a year, that's it. A little different in the new covenant, having had our sins forgiven, having been cleansed, now being a sanctified vessel, the Holy Spirit comes in. And as the Holy Spirit comes in, this thing that we talk about here being sons and daughters becomes a reality in our lives. In that, looking at the contrast between the old and the new, am I indebted to God? Oh, you bet I am. There is nothing about me that would merit this transaction. That he would no longer look at me as outside, that he would actually adopt me. So indebted to God and adopted by God. And we'll look at that, that we're joint heirs with Jesus, that all of the rights that Jesus has, not, and I mean, yeah, we're talking about the moral image of God. We're not talking about, we don't get the omnis and all this stuff. We're not going to shoot lightning bolts out or anything like that. But, but we do get full access to the Father in the same measure as Jesus himself. We're joint heirs. It's, it, I, it's just inconceivable to me when you start exploring the depths of what that means. I'll tell you what, <laughs> if that doesn't light your fire, you got wet wood. It is really a profound thing. So sons and daughters, no longer far off, but brought near by the blood of Christ. Verses 18 to 25, our fourth dive or our fourth hike up the hill. <laughs> free from the curse. Go all the way back to Adam. Eve looking at that fruit, seeing it was good for food and it was desirable to make one wise. Humanity was cursed at that point. And we live on a cursed world. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the results, the effect of the curse, sin, hatred of God. We're going to look at present suffering in this world. Do you ever wonder why do bad things, I mean really horrible things happen to, and I'll use air quotes, good people. Do you ever wonder? I mean, yeah, the Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. I get that. But do you ever wonder about suffering in our world and God's part in that? We're going to talk about that. We'll talk about that at length. This is really important that we have a right understanding. I used to do bereavement work after my daughter went to heaven. I got involved in, in working with people who were bereaved, who had lost a significant loved one. I saw suffering. I went through some of that myself. And that's why my heart was towards people that were going through that dark, dark place. Suffering. Life hits us, gang. There are things that crop up. I mean, I was sitting at home yesterday and, and Stacy said, honey, I think there's somebody at the door. And so I went to the door and the, the, the guy that lives across the street from me 
was standing there, Frank, and, 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 and I just said, hey, Frank, what's going on? And, and, and he was broken up. He was suffering. He said, an hour ago, I went next door because Joanne is the, the gal that lives right across the street from us, but one door over. He said, Joanne's daughter came over, she couldn't get her on the phone, and I just went into her house an hour ago and found her dead. And I mean, he was undone. And I just said, oh man. And, and I spoke with him for a while and we prayed together. Suffering. We all go through it. That doesn't mean that God's turned his back. That doesn't mean that God is in any way joyful about it. It doesn't mean any of that. What it does mean is that God will use those times. I wrote, after my daughter went to heaven, I wrote, if it weren't for the lessons that could only be learned when, life's, when, when one's life is pressed in on every side, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. I felt like for a whole year, like I was getting drugged through glass every day. That's, that's this life. That's the reality. Does it mean that God's just, like I said, that he's just abandoned us to our own deal? No, not at all. He's merciful. He's compassionate. He loves us. So we'll talk about present suffering as Christians. We're going to also look at the fact that creation hopes for freedom from the curse. Because you know what? I think it's really interesting that when Jesus went to the cross, he died for the sins of humanity, right? I mean, we get that. It's pretty much Christianity 101. But beyond that, it's like, we still live on a fallen earth. Why didn't he just renew that then? Because he purchased the right to take the title to the earth back at the cross. But he hasn't taken it back yet. It's not until you look in Revelation chapter 5 where John is broken. He says, I don't see, I, I see the scroll. And the scroll is the title deed to this fallen planet. He says, I didn't find anybody that was worthy to take the scroll. And then, and then one as a lamb, still having the marks of slaughter. That's a picture. Stepped up and took the scroll. And then he began to unseal the scroll. And at that point, the wrath of God is poured out as God now begins to purge the earth from sin. True stuff, not just Bible stories. It will happen. But he hasn't done it yet. It, it, we're told here in Romans that the earth was subjected to futility and that the creation groans. Creation hopes for it. We hope for it. And there are times just like, Lord, just get me off of this dirt ball. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's times where I think, well, oh, it's a beautiful place. But you know, the world has fallen. Like I said, I can't look at the news. I mean, I, I still scan the headlines and all that. I want to be informed, but I just can't go there right now. I just can't go in depth and look at every, because it's like every day I look and there's some new crazy thing. A total fulfillment of what was prophesied that men are calling what is good evil and what is evil good. You look at that with a sanctified, with a renewed mind and you just go, how on earth did they get there? Men's hearts are dark. We live on a fallen world. So how do we do, how do we navigate that? That's where we're going to go when we look at hike number four, free from the curse. The fifth one that I have here, verses 26 to 30, God is for us. Do you believe that? Frankly, I mean, really, I mean, it's a great thing to say in church. <laughs> but do you really believe that God is for you? That he advocates for you? That he really is for you? That's where we're going to look at that, that famous verse that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And there are times where in my, it's like, Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. I think, how is anything good going to come out of this? We're going to look at that. Because he is always working ahead of us. Always. I don't know what you're facing this morning. I don't know what trials you have in your life. I know I have some. And, and, and 
if, if you're not going through a trial, you're either just coming out of one or you're about to go into one because they're part of this life. Take courage. Let your heart be encouraged. God's plans are good. Exceedingly good. We don't see it. We, you know, and it's not in the contract, by the way, for him to tell us. He doesn't give us a roadmap. He doesn't say, hey, this is what's going to happen next week, so I want you to get prepared. Put on your seatbelt. It's going to be a bumpy ride. You know, he doesn't do that. But this stuff hits us, doesn't it? Those unexpected things, those phone calls that come. I've had my share of phone calls in the middle of the night. Those people that you trusted and, and now they're gone or they're angry. Funny, at the pastor's conference, one of the pastors was saying, you know, it used to be when people left the church, they just left the church. Now they just, now they leave and they assassinate you daily on Facebook. <laughs> I just thought, oh, that's horrible. But the point in this is that God's plans are good. That he is for us. He is working ahead of us. And as we walk by faith, it's important to keep that in mind because we don't see it doesn't mean that he's not there. I have often said that in Romans 8, 28, that yeah, God's working all things together for good. And yet 8, 29 tells us why. Because he's conforming us to the image of his son. And sometimes that's as easy as going to a Bible study like this and saying, wow, Lord, thank you. Sometimes it's through that being drugged through glass stuff where God is doing some really powerful work. Have you ever noticed, I mean, I'm somewhat of a student of church history. I don't know tons about it, but trends. Through church history, when, when the church begins to be persecuted, and baby, let me tell you, that may be coming here sooner than you think. It's already here in many places, not in our church, but it's driving by every day. But when God's people are persecuted, you know what happens? They get strong. And there's a sifting that goes on, yeah, because it's like <laughs> people bail, they jump off the ship. But truly, God's people get stronger under persecution. And that's a reality. That's a historic fact. Take courage. Because you're not living for this present world. You're living for the Lord. Also, he recaps in... in uh, Verse 30, about the fact that we are justified. The end of that, at the end of all of it, is that we will be glorified. That one day we're going to be there with him forever. The sixth and uh, the final one I want to look at here, and we could spend weeks on this, and that's the supremacy of God's love. The supremacy of his love. His love is supreme. We're going to look at the fact, too, that in verse 31, that we're going to look at there, that he has a protective love. How do you feel about your kids? I shared with you guys not long ago about my son being at the, at, at the baseball stadium, and this guy was bugging him, so I stood right between him and the guy bugging him and uh, said, hey, buddy, you got a problem with my son? And, and my son was so mad at me because he was about to sell his hat to the guy for 10 bucks. <laughs> And I ruined the sale. But God is a protective, he is a protective father. I, I love the verse in Isaiah where he says, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. Why? Because I've got this. You're my child. You are my beloved. He's protective. Nothing can befall us that's outside of his divine, specifically ordained will. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about God's love is a giving love. You know, it's something we talk about a lot when we talk about being servant-hearted. We talk about being others-centered. That's a manifestation of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because left to me, left to myself... <laughs> I used to teach Sunday school, and I would tell the I used the same passages as I would teach adults. 
but I would change the applications. And I would say something like, okay, let's say you and your sister get to the cupboard. It's breakfast time, and you grab the box of cereal. There's only enough for one bowl. Who gets it? And it was just, a, and I can see the kids like, they're like, oh, I, oh, oh, you know, <laughs> just watching God move in their hearts and all of that. But you know what? The same thing applies to us. Left to ourselves, we're very conditional. And, and we're not real giving. I mean, I, yeah, some of us more so than others. I, and I'm not wanting to just indict everybody in the room. But the point is, is that when we look at our great example, Jesus himself, Absolutely the servant. Absolutely the one who put himself last. Absolutely the one who elevated others. And then he gave these profound lessons saying, you want to be great? Go low. Uh, That's why I resist a hierarchy in a church. Uh, You know, the the whole corporate model in the United States is not, (laughs) it's not CEO, I was reading the Babylon Bee this week, and one of the articles they had was how to get people to come back to your church, and, and one of them was uh, give backstage passes to the pastor after church. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny. But it's not, it's not the CEO thing. No, it's, it's the upside-down pyramid. If you, want to, if you want to be involved in God's kingdom, you go low. You become other-centered. You become servant-hearted. That's the example that we have in our Lord and Master. I mean, all the way through, even now, into the future, when you look and you read about the marriage supper of the Lamb in the book of Revelation, there's a passage in Luke. I don't remember the address right off. But it talks about in that day, when we are there and we are at the marriage supper of the Lamb, guess who serves us? Guess who wraps himself with an apron and serves us? That's going low. So we're going to talk about the giving love that God has. And, of course, it's an unconditional love. When we look at the supremacy of God's love, we see that it's without condition. That he loves us because, and you know what? That's the essence of grace, guys. Grace is not Oh, hey, you know, you're a pretty nice guy. Let me pat you on the head and tell you how wonderful you are. Grace is saying, you know what? I choose to love you because of who I am. And that's what God does with us. Because of who he is, he chooses to love us. And now, as he works in our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit, he gives us a love for others. And it it ought to be grace-based, not performance-based. I'll tell you what, if it was performance-based, none of us would live let alone merit anything. He says the wages of sin is death here in Romans. But it's an unconditional love that says, I am putting you ahead of me. I'm putting your need ahead of mine. I am putting your whatever it is. I'm elevating that as more important than mine. We're told to, to, to love one another this way. Yeah, it's the way that God loves us. He says, let me fill you with your love, with my love. And, and there's one thing that I want you to do with it, John. Give it away. Give it away. Don't, don't be like that servant that went and buried everything I gave him and expected me to be happy with him. Invest well in the lives of others. The Bible tells us to esteem one another as more important than ourselves because we have a huge, great example in the person of Christ himself. So we're going to take some hikes. <laughs> we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to pack up, and we're going to go looking for godly wisdom, not just knowledge. And, and, and we're, going to, we're going to have a base camp here. I, I love that metaphor, and you know, maybe it's goofy to you, but I connect with things like that. But, you know, I just love the metaphor of, you know, let's, let's have this base camp because we're not going to, as you can see, there is so much in this chapter. There is no way that I would do it any justice if I didn't take the time for us to just work through it. Uh, verse by verse, 
reality by reality, concept by concept, it, it, we've got to do this right. Pray for me. Because in the same way that if I were standing here at 65 years old, <laughs> looking at a big mountain and thinking, yeah, I'm going to climb that baby. <laughs> right. <laughs> in myself. Yeah, there's an in- inadequacy in me. I mean, and I was thinking about us praying, uh, sitting at my desk the other day studying and thinking, Lord, I, 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 I just totally identify with the psalmist in this, where he says, it is high. I can't attain it. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. If I rise up into heaven, you're there. If I go to the depths of the earth, behold, you're there. Pray. Pray for yourself. This is going to be a great study. This is going to be an in-depth study, and we're going to tag the bases and just pray that we can, by the power, again, it's all by the power of the Spirit, that we can parse through these things, make sense out of them, and especially... I'll tell you what, you apply these things to your life, your life will be changed. It'll be transformed. And if you're already walking in a changed life, that's great. It will be further. You will grow. That's not my opinion. That's the guarantee of God's word. Let's pray. Father, as we um, take a brief look, an overview of of Romans chapter 8, I I know my heart, I just get excited. Uh, It's just such a blessing such a privilege to study your word. And we know, again, without your spirit illuminating your word to us, that there's no way that we would make sense of it. We might know what it says, but we wouldn't understand. We wouldn't have understanding of what it means. We wouldn't have the ability to now walk in wisdom of what it means to us and how it applies to us and all of those things. So, Father, we're grateful that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you desire to open your word to us. Pray that in the weeks ahead that you would do just that. We love you. We praise you this morning. We thank you for your work in our lives, for that unconditional love that you pour out on our lives every day. Thank you that we're accepted in the beloved. We're grateful. In Jesus' name. Amen.